Liberty Entrepreneurs Podcast, Episode 89, Austrian Econ, Bitcoin, and Living Free with guest Naomi Brockwell. I'm your host, Ash Oro, and let's do this. Hey, welcome back, everyone. Liberty Entrepreneurs Podcast. I'm your host, Ash Oro, and we've got a very interesting guest today, the one and only Naomi Brockwell. She is, uh, if you're in the libertarian or the cryptocurrency circles, you obviously know who she is. Television and film producer, the creator of the Naomi Brockwell TV, where she hosts Bitcoin, blockchain, and the technology of, of our future. She's also currently a producer for Stossel and has produced in the past for Fox Business Network and Fox News Channel. Hey, Naomi, welcome to the show. Hi, are we, is this a, just a podcast or is this video too? This is video too. Hi, I just didn't know whether to wave or not because you know that wave would be lost otherwise. <laughs> I mean, otherwise we wouldn't see this amazing background that you have seemingly hey, you randomly like my, put together. You like my random <laughs> background? Hi, me too. This, uh, is a, this is my smart cash B. Uh, no offense, EOS, but you guys haven't sent me an EOS B. Uh, I got my television. This was designed by one of my Twitter followers, uh, awesome guy who also did the Satoshi roundtable image you would have seen. Um, and then this one was a thing. There you I, go. I wasn't sure if that little orange thing was a television or the head of a robot that you decapitated. Ooh, both. Yeah, okay. Uh, Naomi, tell us. I'm really curious about your journey in building freedom and you've been in the libertarian circles for as long as I have. And that's saying something. Would you mind telling us about pre libertarian Naomi Brockwell and how, Ooh. what was your entry point into this whole rabbit hole? That's a great question. I don't know if there was a pre libertarian Naomi Brockwell. She's pretty libertarian. Um, I would say I didn't know what the word libertarian meant until I moved to the United States. In Australia, everyone's kind of very centrist and complacent. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and say it. Uh, I think it's to do with the political structure. Like in, in America, it's very polarized. And I think it's getting more that way in Australia. But the way the, the political system is set up in America, um, you it's not compulsory to vote. And so in order to attract people to take out the time and you know take the energy to go out and cast a vote, you're like really appealing to the people who care the most. And they're probably like mm -hmm. on the fringes. They're on the far sides. And so I find that the, the discussions are just like completely polarizing. Whereas in Australia, it's compulsory. Everyone is going to be voting. Oh. You're not going to be appealing to as many um, people if you're like, I'm all the way over here. So mm -hmm. everything seems to be very centrist in there. And, um, and I think that maybe affects, uh, affects society in, in uh, certain ways that people don't fully realize. But I guess my, my, um, my entrance into being really, really interested, um, I came to America and I, oh gosh, I don't even know where to start. This is a complicated question, Ash. I, I first got interested in economics. So Austrian economics was my entry point. All I was right. very interested in the housing crisis, read Thomas right. Sowell, Housing Boom and Bus. Um, I read Una MacDonald. She wrote a great book um, about the American dream turned into the American nightmare. So I was like fascinated in learning about these governmental policies. And then that led me to learn about like the central bank and Fannie and Freddie. And, and so I just kind of went down this rabbit hole and then central bank kind of became like, my my go-to issue like the that was my was main was for a while wasn't it? absolutely my yeah, my main ball. issue was was central banking because i just figure whoever controls the money supply controls every single thing in society i was like that's right there that's the fulcrum right. that's like the crux of everything so yeah. i think that's what led me into it and that's why i love bitcoin so much because that was sort of you know those two things go hand in hand and when did you come to the United States? And was it Ron Paul's presidential campaign in 07, 08 that really kicked this off for you? No, it wasn't. Um, so I, I was actually at opera school when I discovered Ron Paul. Okay, and, what, is, what is opera school? Opera, as in, oh, oh opera. I sing opera. <laughs> um, so I, was, I moved to New York um, eight years ago. And I, uh, I went to an academy for classical music in Manhattan and, um, and one of my friends, because everyone there, even, even though I wasn't fully into 
uh, I guess, libertarianism yet. I remember one guy actually coming up to me and saying like, oh, are you super excited that Ron Paul might win the election? Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm like, who? <laughs> he was like, like, Ron Paul, like he may be like the first libertarian candidate that we've had. And I was like, libertarian? Yeah, I guess I'm, guess I'm libertarian. I kind of put the pieces together, but I, it was really like economics that got me first interested in, in all of this. And obviously, her learning about Ron Paul, then I was following his campaign very closely. Sure. Um, and so that was a delight, an unexpected delight. So you found Austrian economics before Ron Paul? I did. Okay. Yes. And I found it, it, it because the crash. it was the crash because I would go to these Same. meetings or people would chat to me and they'd be, we'd be talking about like all the bad things that happened and something just didn't make sense mm. in what everyone was saying. I was like, there's something missing here. You know, you can't, you can't just blame this one thing that happened. Like, I mean, it didn't, it didn't make sense. And uh, I felt like no one really understood what was going on. Like what, what really caused it? What were the underlying issues? Like what was going on at the time? And I wanted to learn more. And, um, and so I went, I remember I went to a meeting in New York, the Junto, and it was like a, a weekly, a monthly meeting that was, um, at the time, it was, well, I remember, it, actually, that's a, a different story, but basically it was moderated at the time by um, Iris Bell, who was the graphic designer for Ayn Rand, and I became friends with her and a bunch of other people, so we used to have, like, philosophy discussion nights and things, but I used to go to this junto that she moderated, and, um, and the junto was, like, a monthly meeting group for talking about philosophy, economics, and, uh, and trading. So I'd go to this, this meeting, and one night, Jean Epstein was giving a presentation on the housing crash and I was already very curious about this topic and he was saying all kinds of words that I'd never heard before in my life. And so I was just like taking notes, you know, like, <laughs> what, like what did he say? And, right. um, and afterwards I sent him an email and I was like, can I meet with you and ask you questions? And, and, um, and he was very gracious. And he, he, I, I also said like, I'm going to ask stupid questions. I don't know anything about this stuff. So let me know whatever reading I need to do to get brushed up mm -hmm. so that I ask smart questions or less dumb questions. Yeah. And so he, um, he gave me a reading list and um, obviously it included like Rothbard and Mises and Hayek and everyone who knows Gene Epstein knows that he's a big Gaussian economist. Um, mm -hmm former former economics editor of, of Barron's and um and so I read all these books we chatted for hours in his office and then I just fell down into that rabbit hole I was just really interested in learning as much as I could about these ideas so I guess that was the the entry point there and, and since we're on Austrian economics something I am very passionate about and I fell down the rabbit hole in 2007 and 8 of, of Austrian economics through Ron Paul and Peter Schiff and Mises Institute <laughs> What do you think it is about Austrian economics that can be so captivating? You know what? I studied economics in college and it wasn't captivating. It was right. awful. It was like, you know, I'd learn these things and I have to rote learn, you know, all these, these things. I, the things I was being told, like, they didn't quite make sense. Like there was one thing that applied for, for the individual, but something else applied for society. And I'm like, how does that work? Right. You know, how do you justify those things? So I only studied for like a year and a half um, in that. And I was like, no, <laughs> not doing this. And uh, I never thought that that would be a topic I'd be interested in again. What interested me in Austrian economics, like especially reading, it was Rothbard's, uh, the first book sort of in the Austrian economic circle. Well, I guess it was Thomas Sowell, actually. So mm -hmm. even though he's not technically like Austrian right. uh, by any means, he really writes uh, with a lot of that mindset, a very free market um, uh, mentality. And so reading housing boom and bust, I was like, wow, kind of going into all these policies. Um, it, I just found it so interesting. And then I read Rothbard's, what has the government done to our money? Oh, and yeah. And it was just like this aha moment for me where I realized that there was so much more going on um, that was outside of the purview of what mainstream media was ever going to cover. Like mainstream media is going to pick these topics that polarize and are total um, distractions for us. They're these, you know, red 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 flags that that they put up over here so you're like oh what's going over there and you're not paying attention then to over any here it's like <laughs> Yeah, any of the issues that are going on and you read more about these things that no one knows about and they seem so important when you read them, you just can't help but think, why isn't anyone talking about this? Right. And then it became more like a call to action, like more people need to know about this. You know, if I'm just discovering this and I completely lost interest in economics before, but I'm finding this fascinating, like we need to tell people how important this stuff is and get people to talk about this. Like a central bank devaluing our money by 2% every year, you know, like that's that sort of goal. stuff. Like the, 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 the 
they tell us, they promise yeah. us that they'll devalue our currency. By yeah. And not only that, like there's, there's nothing you, there's no control you have over any of that. You think that like people want control over their lives. They want their little pocket of, of space. They want their little pocket of time. They want to be able to organize things, you know, according to their preferences in that, that little pocket that they've created. Mm -hmm. And the problem is, is that there's so much stuff out of their control and they don't realize it. And that's because the government is forcing us into these, these systems that ultimately hurt us, you know, by, by having a monopoly on the money supply, they're ultimately hurting us uh, because they could do whatever they want. They can devalue it. And people look at like the consumer price index as some metric of, well, you know, those TARP bailouts didn't affect us at all. We didn't deval devalue anything. It's like, are, right. are you serious? Technology is getting better and better every day. So everything in our lives should be getting cheaper and cheaper. Mm -hmm. The fact that the carton of milk is going up in value should tell you something yeah, right. you know, about, about the actual rate of inflation. It's not just that 2% that is going up because the underlying technology, it, like the cost to produce all the stuff is going way down. Right. So, you know, if it's not as reflected in the price, something's going on. And then you just look at, wait a second, obviously when you have some sort of cash injection into the economy, the first people who benefit are going to be the ones who receive that first. Mm. So where's all that money that the cash injection is going to? And right. you look at Wall Street and you look at, you know, the stock markets that just go up and up and up and you look at houses where you have these government, um, you know, policies that just well, they dictate the amount of loans that need to be um, underwritten. And they have all kinds of like weird policies that people have to have to abide by. And then you just see this giant augmentation in the, the housing market. And uh, and then you see these giant crashes. And then, you know, crash happens. Everyone goes, oh, the free market. Free. Like, the free, yeah, the this free market's bad. not working. And then the houses just climb back up in price and everyone's yeah. like, this is fine. It's, it's like fine. that meme where the buy is going on in the background. Everyone's like, this yeah. is fine, you know, as if... Yeah. As if we, you know, that somehow the policies aren't completely the same that the government is implementing that created the first housing crash. So it's like, is this system no one talks about? And I think that's why it's so interesting to me because I see the importance of it and I see how it's swept under the rug and I mm -hmm. see how we're distracted so easily by these things that don't matter uh, in the scheme of things and that like, you know, people are really getting hurt by what's mm -hmm. going on. And it's like these basic fundamental building blocks of an economy that nobody's talking about interest rates and, yeah. uh, and a centralization, a, a monopolization of the money supply. And, you know, in what warped fantasy, socialist fantasy is one organization setting the interest rates for the rest of the economy. I mean, this is absurd. It, it's, you know, it, I can remember the, the tarp bailouts and stuff, of course, but also the, the automobile bailouts where I think it was like cash for clunkers or something like that back in the day where you could send in a car and as long as it would like crank up and you could drive it onto a lot, they would give mm -hmm. you a minimum amount so that you could put it towards a new car purchase. And at the time, I, I, Peter Schiff is one of the people that I fell on down this rabbit hole with. And I was like, oh yeah, I never even thought about that. You know, you think, oh, spending is good. Well, what happens to the savers whenever, whenever spending is incentivized? Well, we have to have inflation to keep all the spending together. And it, it, out, at the end of the day, it comes out of the pocket of the savers, which whenever I figured that out, I was like, oh, gold and silver. That's why gold and silver are important. Pre-crypto, were you in the gold and silver space or did you move straight from, I'm learning Austrian economics. Okay, Bitcoin's already here. That's my path. Well, I didn't discover Bitcoin until like 2012. So I was already down the Australian economics rabbit hole by then. So definitely interested in gold at that stage. Um, I think that, yeah, the aha moment came from, I mean, interest rates in Australia are quite different from in America. So at the moment on just like a, a term deposit or like a certain, you know, um, savings account in Australia, you might get... 1.5% interest, you might get 2%. Um, four years ago, you'd get like 4% interest. Like it was, it was kind of crazy. And so me coming to America and then I remember asking my bank, so what kind of accounts do you have? Like what are the interest rates? And they're like, what? Oh, you're cute. No, you? it's, it's all zero. <laughs> And, um, and then, so then shortly after I kind of learned about this steadily, steady erosion of the value of my savings. And I was like, okay, so you can kind of justify, like if you're putting your money in, in a bank account that has 4% interest rate, you're getting a, a bunch of money back and you're like, cool, I'm happy. I'm getting, I'm earning money by my, my cash sitting here. And, um, and then even when it goes to 2% and you learn about inflation, you're like, okay, well, at least I'm maintaining the value-ish, you in. know, yeah, whatevs. Yeah. And then you come to America and you're like, I'm getting 0%. So any money that's sitting in my bank account, I know that this time next year, I would have lost 2% of that money. That's yeah. huge. 
That's like, that, that's a huge amount of people's savings. And, and people don't really understand that because they see the same amount of money the following yeah, year. And they don't understand that it's a very different purchasing power than it had a year ago. Yeah, that inflation is the silent taxation. They and if we can even trust that it's just 2%, you know, yeah, after the- no way the, to even measure it. We're, yeah, we're, the billions of dollars that were injected into the economy during the TARP bailouts. I mean, yeah. that has taken a, a huge toll. Just look at the purchasing power of your dollar compared to what kind of a house you can buy these days, you know, compared yeah. to 10 years ago. It's just, it's astronomical. Like your purchasing power doesn't buy you nearly as much, but because it's only like, we only really see it so obviously in this luxury good that is buying your own house that, you know, these days people in their 20s aren't talking about, like, you know, that's reserved for the, the baby boomer generation. These days, you know, I, I think that, that our generation is, is like going to be, um, we're so happy about the idea of renting because it seems like so far out of our, our oh, reach, yeah. like buy a house these like, days. Forget it. Are you kidding me? <laughs> because the money has been devalued so much because mm. they, we just don't have the purchasing power to do that. Back in the 60s, everyone did, you know, yeah. like, well, not everyone necessarily. It, it's, you know like, I mean? it's like, like yeah, it's like got the you a lot further. Yeah, it's like the meme old economy Steve. You know, he was like dropped out of college on my way home. I got a job and then I had a family with a wife and two kids. And on part time, I was able to put them through college, you know, and now. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like yeah. Good old days, you know. And now it's like, well, I am having no kids and my yeah. husband and I both work 17 yeah. hours a day. Yeah. And uh, one day when we're 60, we hope to be able to put down a deposit on a house. Yeah. Like, it's like, no, thank you, Starbucks. I have to drink this Folgers coffee over here yeah. because I'm saving for a house for 50 years. No, it's wild. And, you know, house prices are so high because, of course, interest rates are held so low. I know, I know this is turning into a bit of an economics podcast, but that's fine with me. Welcome to Economics 101. <laughs> <laughs> Ash Oro and Naomi Brockwell. <laughs> it, it's just, you know, the, the relationship between personal economics and personal freedom to me is, is so significant in the journey of building freedom. And if you, don't, if you don't have the ability to identify and define what real money is and what money is not, and if you don't understand that all value is subjective and so that there is no objective, there is no intrinsic value. These are like fundamental building blocks that I feel like give me personally a, a big time competitive advantage over someone who hasn't studied Austrian economics. Well, it, I, th I definitely agree with that. And I think that there are, there are different ways that um, monetary policy affects all of us. And that's why that became my, my pet issue. On the one hand, you're talking about like individual financial sovereignty, which I think like from a rights perspective is really important. Um, and that's, you know, one of my key issues as well. But then you just look from a, a pragmatic perspective. There are other things that come into play. So, <coughs> pardon me. So um, if, if you're talking about the, the government's ability, like we just hit a debt ceiling again, right? Mm -hmm. And you just think of the trillions of dollars in debt we are. It's like, what is it, 23 trillion? But I, I'm not sure where we're at. It just gets, it grows every trillions day. Trillions of trillions. And, um, and so there's so much money that we're spending on things uh, without actually having that money to spend, like way above our means right now. And if you think about how the state is, able to leverage that much money on all these things. Like you think about all the programs out there that you wouldn't agree with if you knew about them, like all of the money just going back into the pockets of, of, um, you know, of, of dodgy people. You, you look at uh, like corrupt politicians who, uh, you know, taking private jets everywhere and taxpayer money is paying for that. You look at, um, you know, the, the corporatism. The, to, but, well, you look at the, yeah, the favoritism as well, where you get these handouts to certain companies and I'm not talking about tax breaks. I'm talking about, handouts mm -hmm. to companies subsidies that the government is actually you know paying to prop up certain companies that happens a lot in agriculture We're like why why do we have like why are we subsidizing the sugar industry right. for god's sake why yeah. are we subsidizing corn when you just end up with high fructose corn syrup in every single thing you buy because it's so easy, like cheap for them to to produce because they're just getting so many handouts because so, we're paying for it yeah and if you think about like the government's ability to do that they're able to do that because they print all this money, they right? They have a monopoly because, on the money supply. Because they just create it all. So yeah. if you think about all of the things that you don't agree with, that, you know, come as this, uh, this, this positive externality of 
changing our financial system. Mm-hmm. Like we could get rid of a lot of these corporate bailouts that, that you don't like. We, we could have you know, stopped them being able to leverage the money to bail out Wall Street. We could stop them having the ability to go and bomb all these countries that mm-hmm. we really shouldn't be interfering with. So all of these awful things that happen in society, like wars, they're only able to be financed because the government, government has a monopoly on the money supply um, and is able to leverage that. So um, there's so much control that we could take back by taking back control of the money supply. I think all of the power stems from that. I agree. And this is the beautiful thing about cryptocurrencies and, and why I support all cryptocurrencies, Bitcoin, Bitcoin Cash, EOS, obviously, even Ripple. I mean, you know, all these have really bad names, but whenever I'm old enough to have lived through a couple technology bubbles and I can remember file sharing, I can remember dot com, you know, now it, it's social media and now it's blockchain. It's like the government has never really had to compete in a real sense for the creation of money. Yes, they've had to compete with each other and maybe the the euro the pound sterling the yen and the dollar but they all talk about this stuff right they're not really competing it's more cooperation it's like okay you devalue yours a little bit this year and we'll devalue ours a little bit this year and we'll keep that peg but now we've got free market money on a global scale that we've never seen before because they were able to crush gold and silver and you know the precious metals monies uh, to the point that they know they no longer competed against the fiat government currencies and now what we're seeing is yeah I wouldn't want to fund voluntarily I wouldn't want to fund hardly any of government programs you know almost none of them maybe none of them at all because I don't you know I don't think government is in its current form is necessary uh, for the survival and thriving of humans but just within the EOS community, we have this uh, worker proposal system and where we had 5% inflation every year, 1% of it paid for our block producers, our miners, if you will, to keep our, our network secure. And then 4% originally was for works projects, maybe their infrastructure projects, maybe their educational projects, maybe they're funding social programs and stuff like that. But at least we have a voice now, at least, you know, at least we can say, no, thank you. I don't want an extra 4% inflation. I'm going to spin up my own EOS chain with me and my homies right here. And we're going to have half a percent inflation. And so it's going to help protect our purchasing power if we choose to have EOS token, for instance, as our money. But the rate of iteration that we're finding right now in all these cryptocurrency projects is both on the monetary and the fiscal side of things where how much money should we print and how should it be spent? Governments have never really had to compete against this before. What what do you think the long-term implications of that is? I think that it's only positive. I mean, people tend to look down on all these coins, like, oh, it's all shit and people are losing money. It's like, well, actually, you're getting a huge amount of discovery going on right now. People are competing. People for the first time in a long time are actually talking about what the correct rate of inflation should be. Right. What, you know, what, what is the correct supply of, of money? What is like all of these, these factors that have to do with the money that we've never even considered because we didn't have a choice and we didn't care and we didn't know anything about it. Suddenly this is a topic of discussion that is like, you know, ardently debated uh, in, in, in crypto circles. And I love that. I love that. And yes, you're going to have a lot of failed projects. We've already seen a lot of failed projects come and go. And that's great because every time something comes and doesn't work and and disappears, then we learn something and someone creates a better project. So I love the idea that there's so much competition out there. And as you said, if you don't like something, you can create your own. I mean, I I get people telling me all the time, like, well, what happens when they shut down Bitcoin? (laughs) And, And I'm like, well, there are already some issues with what you're saying, but okay, I'll play this game. Let's say they shut down Bitcoin. Great. So Bitcoin 2.0 comes up. Then right. they shut down that. Then Bitcoin 3.0 and 4.0 and 5. And the point is, is that we have the technology to create systems that you know can't be shut down. And if the government somehow is able to hamper them enough that they're not really used, we can, we can create a new one. And yeah. the great thing about tech is that it always stays a few steps ahead of government, Mm -hmm. you know, because the government is the slow bureaucracy that takes a while to react and, um, and, uh, and to keep up with everything going on. And by that time, you know, they're already working on, on new things um, that the government will have to deal with down the track. So that's not a given. It's not always going to be the way necessarily that tech stays a few steps ahead of government. Um, 
up until recently, we've had a relatively free technological um, uh, industry. Um, you know, there just hasn't been a lot of regulation in tech, and we are seeing more of that. So that could be a way for government to slow things down. But at the same time, you have these wonderful industrious people who are all kind of dedicating their lives and time to building products that that enhance people's freedom, that enhance people's privacy, that enhance their autonomy, and they're really passionate about this. And I don't see those people disappearing uh, anytime soon um, so you know as long as we keep supporting people like that then I then I hope we'll be okay yeah it, it just it's a good reminder that the tribalism within our within the libertarian circles the tribalism within the cryptocurrency circles it's like hey we're yeah we're competing with each other but who, who are we really competing against here we're competing against the people that have been fleecing us for generations <laughs> and generations right the, the, we're competing against the people who for some reason think that they not only can but deserve to have a monopoly on money yeah. uh, i want to switch gears here a little bit let's let's talk about um libertarianism specifically not necessarily the economics aspect of libertarianism but living free I, I believe you're in new hampshire which is the live free or die state and i'm semi-familiar with the free state project from back in the day what's what's the idea there is it that local that you're able to live more free if you live locally Absolutely. Um, the idea that currently, how many how many millions of people are in America right now? It's like three hundred and fifty million, right? right. And um, and you think that they're all operating under the same rules? Like we have three hundred and fifty million people in America that all have this, you know, federal government deciding the rules yeah, all for all agree. of those. Yeah. I mean, th what happens every election should be an indication of why we shouldn't be having blanket rules to cover all of these mm. people, right? Because fifty percent of the population hates the other fifty percent of the population. And every four years they come this giant clash and then they kind of forget about it and just call each other names on Twitter for four years and then they have a giant clash again. Yeah. And it's like, did you guys ever think that maybe the federal government shouldn't be making these rules that make you both, you know, apply? Maybe like, that's what, not, what? The, <laughs> maybe that's not like, the best consensus mechanism. Yeah, there. it's like, yeah. like California, what if you did just kind of break away and said, listen, we hate Texas. Right. We're going to disappear. We're going to have like, like your smart gun laws where finally, you know, we're going to have, um, you know, uh, yeah. quotas for the number of, of, of uh, women on your boards. <laughs> yeah. We're going to make sure that we have equal uh, outcomes of all those things and make sure that it's dictated that women get paid exactly the same as men and all the things that, that people in California would agree with. And let's just say, you know, wouldn't it be a utopia if you guys could break away and have all the policies you wanted mm -hmm. and you wouldn't have to fight with these people who don't get you and don't understand what you believe in. And right. on the same, same side of things, what about these, these people in Texas? Wouldn't it be great? You know, you could have every, every child is given a gun when they're born. Yeah, you know, sure. you, you don't have to have any rules in your workplace. You're like, you just, you know, go and, and be, be free and do free no hipsters to tell you how to live. No, no hipsters to tell you how to live. And, um, you know, don't have to listen to um cortez at all aoc like wouldn't be something you have to deal with you know it just makes no sense to me that these two groups are literally just forcing each other uh, into misery yeah into into like i mean is is the point of these policies when people fight every election is the point to create policies for a world that you really believe in or is the point to punish the other 50 percent of the population right. that you disagree with because i see so much punishment mentality out mm -hmm. there like if someone was like hey you could just walk away from this and this person won't hurt you anymore. Um, you know, th that would create a much more peaceful society. But instead, people are bent on like, well, they did this thing. They used this drug and they weren't meant to. So I'm going to put them in jail for 40 right. years. It's yeah. this punishment mentality. It's that I very just... shame and blamey, isn't it? Yeah, it's terrible. And so I like when you're talking about whether living locally is better. I mean, yeah, I definitely think that people should have the ability to move to a place with people who agree with them and create a society society that works for them because you think about how different people in um you know new hampshire are to the people in new york mm. to the people in california to the people in oregon to the people in texas to the people in florida like these are all very different types of people let's yeah. stop pretending it's, that it's, everyone is the same like you know you, you move to florida you're probably the type of person that really enjoys going to the beach and having sunshine all the time and you know you're probably a very different person to the person who lives in new 
York and is, grows up with the sound of honking horns and giant buildings that never mm -hmm. let sunshine through and they work 17 hours a day, you know? So like, I don't, I don't like the idea of someone forcing someone else to live under rules because they think that they're best for them. Let someone else decide what's best for them and find right. like-minded people who can agree. So the more we can take power away from the federal level, give it to the states, the better. The more we can take better power away from the federal and states and give it to very Love local the area, yeah. the better again. So, you know, that's, that's why I think the Free State Project is so interesting to me because it's a group of like-minded people that said, all right, you know, if, if this is what's going to happen, if we're all going to be forced to live under blanket rules, then let's try and congregate in a mm -hmm. community and um, and make a lifestyle that that is good for us. You know, we're not dictated by just by someone who lives like a, a seven hour flight away. Let's right. uh, let's figure out you know, with our context, with our um, environment, with our weather, with our income, with our job opportunities, our personal context. Mm -hmm. what is best for us it, it aren't the ideas of decentralization of power and the non-aggression principle actually fundamentally just very simple they're really simple you know what if someone wants to go and create a socialist commune great if someone wants to go and create you know some sort of like communist um place fantastic if someone wants to go and have this keynesian city that great the point is don't force me to live right. there too so the idea of libertarianism is we don't have enough information it's this idea of the fatal conceit hayek's idea that we don't have enough information to be making these decisions so why not let people voluntarily make them for themselves and not force the decisions on everyone let's let people you know associate and congregate congregate and experiments. I mean, that's what America used to be like. It was the great experimentation, all these different states trying different things. And if you didn't like something in one state, you, you with your feet. vote with your feet. Yeah. And the more power that, that the federal government has, the less ability the individual has to vote with their feet. Yeah. I, I mean, you know, the, the whole idea of the nation state is being challenged on so many levels right now. Uh, you know, blockchains and cryptocurrencies are doing a great job on the money side. But even with the, with the rise of social media, people can much more easily get their opinions out there and see how many other people just completely disagree with them and not only disagree, feel that they have some sort of right to use the government or force against people that they disagree with. And that, mm -hmm. that as it's very that, arrogant, it's very arrogant. It's very arrogant. Like imagine just knowing how hard it is to change yourself. Like I, I'm, I'm constantly trying to think of little, incentives and rewards for myself to get me to act in a certain way to get me to change my habits and behaviors in a certain way and it's really freaking hard now project that on trying to tell someone else to change themselves i want to change right and it's still so hard to change i want you to change I, how how could i ever possibly expect someone else to to live by my rule set or live by my under underlying philosophical understanding of the world whenever it's it's tough enough just for me to do it so it, it is a ridiculous level of arrogance and and socialists in general are extraordinarily arrogant and they're well, i also think that that's because um there's a there's a big asymmetry in how vocal different people from different political persuasions are and the asymmetry is because in something like socialism, you're, you're, the whole premise is that there are certain people that need to be forced to do certain things. So you have to be very vocal in order to communicate that force and say, well, yes, these people are at fault and that we need to expropriate from them. And, you know, this is how we're going to arrange. And it's very, um, it's very specific. And it's very, it's not passive at all. It's very active, right? right? Whereas something like libertarianism is very passive. You know, it, not just talking about like being pacifistic, which we absolutely are. Well, most people are. And um, it, it's more the fact that libertarians understand how much they don't know. Mm -hmm. And because they understand that, they're not going to be as vocal in providing people with the answers. The point is we don't have the answers, right. you know. And we're I'm okay not, with not having all the answers. And we're okay with that. And we're okay with right. people experimenting and trying right. out things, um, to trying to figure out the answers as well. Mm -hmm. I think that as long as you have some way to enforce property rights, mm -hmm. um, then great let people uh deal with that how they want to deal with that and as long as they're not hurting anyone stealing their stuff then 
let them live how they want to live. You know, yeah. the, let, just bringing it back to the war on drugs. I mean, that's just the epitome of, of stupid policy that I can <laughs> think of, right? Because that's something that is not a war on drugs. It's a war on people, For sure. right? Because it's this idea that the government's decided, well, we, we know what's best for you. Mm. And no, you can't have that marijuana for medical purposes because mm. that plant so terrible that, you know, we're going to put a law, you know, protecting you. It's for the betterment of society. Great. And what are the consequences of that? That you're literally protecting that person, right? You're saying, I'm protecting you from your choices and saying that there is from a law. your own like pursuit choices. of happiness. Right. I'm protecting you from your choices. And by in order to protect you, I have to rip away your family, rip away your career, rip right. away your entire life, throw you behind bars where you're going to be sexually abused, where you're going to be physically abused, where you're going to be mentally scarred, and you're going to lose all hope of any sort of life. This one life that you had, we're just going to take that away from you. And for a mandatory minimum sentence, you're going to be away from everyone that you love, and we're going to cripple you so but, but think of what happened if you smoke that weed i know so <laughs> it's like this it's just all about power right we've got to think about how many government policies are just about power or about punishment as we said and not about like what would you know like what what's the correct thing to do like should we be making choices for other people if that person isn't hurting anyone else you know there's no victim in a crime you know, is it actually a crime? Is it a crime? Right. right. And do we like, do we need to punish people when they commit crimes or is it enough to say, well, we're creating a safe society. That person's out of your reach. They're not going to hurt you. We're not necessarily going to punish them. Like there are all these different things that you start to think about. And like, you know, some of my favorite books, like I love um, Michael Humer. Um, I love Triple H as well. Like it's, it's all just very interesting to read some different ways that, that society could be, be um, uh, organized and people don't want to think about it because like this is the society they know and understand they can't conceptualize any other way that society could be organized and I think that there are so many ways that it could be organized you know that 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 idea is exactly why I started Liberty Entrepreneurs because I, I got I look back on my own life and I was like entrepreneurship has created more freedom for me than anything else. More, more than reading the books, more than marching on Washington, more than painting the signs or donating to the campaigns because entrepreneurship requires curiosity. And if, if we can help people re rekindle the flame of curiosity that was beaten out of them by their parents and the public school system and, you know, organized religion, then people wouldn't ask just theoretically who would build the roads. They would actually sit back and think, Huh, okay. Well, how could the roads be built? And mm -hmm. who, who could build them? And who would have the incentive structure to build the roads? And is there a way that we could have a road subscription that we could pay for the roads? Mm -hmm. And the whole idea of building freedom that I think unlocks that creativity in people and that curiosity in people that helps them expand outside of this little bubble that the government tries to keep them in. And so that they can get creative about how, how is value created? You know, how do, we, how do we grow value? Well, it's what? like when I go to the hospital, right? So, you know, I don't have to contract out every single, like when, if I need morphine, I don't have to then write to a morphine company and figure out a contract where I can get one dose of morphine there. I, I don't have to write to the x-ray company and get them to send a thing. Like the hospital kind of organizes all that for you. They bring in the doctors, they bring in all of the supplies, they bring in the, the equipment and the personnel, and they've kind of created this mini society there that you could be a part of. And it, so this idea when people are like, it would be stupid if, if the government didn't build the roads because you'd have a toll road at every single place you went and you'd have to be getting out your wallet every two seconds and all this. It's like, you know what? I'm not getting out my wallet every two seconds in a, right. in a hospital. Why would that the same thing be restaurant. like? Yeah. yeah, in a restaurant, you know, those, those things like it, it doesn't make any sense that, um, like, I mean, these people need to think beyond the immediate result, like what they think of when, when we talk about privatization and especially in the roads. Like there are so many ways that we live currently where things are packaged together in subscriptions things are packaged together and, and made easier that's what the marketplace is about it's about entrepreneurs finding solutions to make our lives better to give value to us so obviously that's a huge market opportunity mm -hmm. if people are dissatisfied by toll roads or whatever great someone's going to go and figure that out and we're going to have a better system that's much better than driving down the pothole filled street because your corrupt government is just put it all care, in, their, right. in their coffers rather than mm -hmm. uh than actually creating work yeah, the, the whole concept of building freedom is so foreign to almost everyone that i encounter but as soon as they hear the term build freedom they're like 
Oh, that's actually really simple. Uh, speaking of building freedom, tell us a little bit more. I, I know that music has played a very influential part of your life. Uh, not only opera. have I own, not only do I know that you went to opera school now, but you're a bit of a, a T Swizzle fan. Oh, and, I love her. I love and, her so much. Taylor Swift, if you're watching this, <laughs> if anyone out there knows Taylor Swift, just like tell her I want to do a duet with her. No, it's not out. a big ask. I yeah. just want to bake cookies. It's, yeah, it's cool. just bake, bake cookies and sing. Yeah. Um, and you, Play with her cats, you know? And you like karaoke. But love you also, her. I think, did a, a J-pop song sometime. Oh, yeah. What, I did lots of songs. Okay. Well, tell us specifically about this J-pop song and what is J-pop and why did you do a J-pop song about Bitcoin? Bitcoin, skinny, iku, abortion. So, <laughs> uh, I did that because I'm obsessed with J-pop, basically. It's not mm -hmm. a very interesting story. I just love it. Like, I just love it. I feel like J-pop is just um, everything. All your senses are heightened. Everything is just like, big and colorful and bright and that's kind of like me to a T, right? I just love that. So um so I fell in love with with J pop and anime and I make music videos all the time. And um in a maybe another life I was a J pop star. Maybe I became a J pop star. I can live out that fantasy vicariously uh just through by doing a small, you know, little example of that and then say, okay, check that off. J pop complete. <laughs> Terrible job. Uh, okay. I, I've sorry, got sorry, Jake Pop community. Uh, <laughs> I apologize, but yeah. And and what is what is Naomi Brockwell TV? Because that's your latest thing, I believe. That's the latest thing. So that is the channel that I set up, and I'm uh, I work with a bunch of different correspondents, put out uh, content every day, focused on tech, but mainly on uh, blockchain tech. So I, as I said, I'm super interested in monetary policy and, and uh, cryptocurrency. So sometimes I'll do like uh, economics uh, videos as well. But m what excites me most is looking at cool things that people are doing. I feel like most media is all about what is this latest oh, scam or, <laughs> you know, well, like whatever bleeds leads, you know, sure. and, and publications have no qualms in, in putting out a hit piece on someone and then retracting it later and no one remembers that they then put out a hit piece. But I don't want to be that person. Mm -hmm. I would rather be focusing on the awesome things that people are creating, the things that excite me, the things that are making the world a better place, um, not the doom and gloom. So if I can be looking at some of the things in, in tech specifically that I think are just making the world better and safer and more private and giving us more freedom and are just cool, like cool gadgets. Who doesn't like cool gadgets? So just right. looking at the, some of we're, the, we're all nerds now. Yeah. The things that come out of people's minds. I just, I just, it just makes me love people like watching that stuff. So that's what the channel is about. And there's a new, new content every day uh, for that. Every day, man. Yeah, every day. Except at the moment because my house was destroyed. And so I've been <laughs> dealing with a lot of um, insurance people and construction workers. But I'm still putting out a lot of content. So well, that, that's, that's <laughs> really awesome. As, as someone who has put out content before, uh, sometimes more frequent than not, I've never put out daily content. And that's, that's quite a, com a commitment. How do you do that? How do you put out daily content? Is there some routine that you go through? Is there some habit that you've built or is it just willpower? Yeah, yes. All of that. Next All question. <laughs> yeah, no, it's just, I mean, I, I'm super active on Twitter and Telegram and, uh, and a lot of other different platforms as well. So sometimes people will request things. They'll say, name me, do an interview with such and such. And I'll be like, ah. Oh. That's interesting. Um, and so it, I, it's kind of like I'm just reaching out to a lot of these people out of my own curiosity, mm -hmm. but then just filming our conversation and putting it out. So like, really, this is just the self-indulgent thing that I do where I just want to learn about all these cool things going on. That's why I'll do I interviews. That's why, yeah, that's why I'll that's why do, we do it. <laughs> and then they'll, they'll give me knowledge and yeah. they'll, they'll talk about things and I'll learn. And, uh, and then I can share that with other people. So hopefully they can learn too. So they're kind of, they can kind of, um, piggyback off me and my insatiable quest. Just for appetite for life. curiosity. You know, yeah. I, feel, I feel that that's why I started living on shores. I was like, I want, I want to just be curious with all these people that I currently don't have mm -hmm. access to. I'll create a podcast and put up a website and then I'll just start interviewing people. It's like, <laughs> It's a really great example of selfishness as a virtue, you know, coming from Ayn Rand. It's like, I was selfish, 
I couldn't satisfy my own curiosity. So I built something, it created freedom and it created opportunity for me. It sounds mm-hmm. like you're doing the same. Uh, I've got, I've got a, we're running low on time here at Naomi. And I want to ask you about some of the documentaries. I'm a, I'm a huge fan of documentaries. I, I, I like them much more than traditional movies. And I, I, I see you've done a couple of them here. Do you want to tell us about one of the, one of your favorite or most successful documentaries you've done? Oh, yeah. I mean, I've, I've, I've had the pleasure of, of working on a bunch of different things. And actually, the most recent piece that I worked on, Jimmy Morrison was the director, and he put together this great, um, this great film that I was able to be a producer on and narrator of uh, that talks about, it's called The Bubble. And, um, and he talks about the housing crash. And I was like, oh, this is right up my alley. <laughs> so I was delighted when he asked me to be a narrator on that. Um, and uh, that gives people a pretty good overview on, on what happened. So I highly, highly recommend that one. And then back in, I think, 2014, we did the filming and it might have been released 2015. We did, um, uh, with Torsten Hoffman, did a, a, a documentary called Bitcoin, The End of Money as We Know It. Mm-hmm. Again, my background, like being obsessed with devouring all the information I could about the history of money. Um, it was just a no brainer for me to want to work and help out with that. So I, um, I shot a bunch of, actually, that's how I first met Bruce, Bruce Fenton back in the day is he mm. was one of the people that I interviewed for that in New York. Mm. Um, so that was really, really cool. Michael Casey, Paul Vigna, there were a couple other people. Gene Epstein was another one that I interviewed. Um, so that was great. And that one, I think it was the audience choice award at Amsterdam film festival. So it did, did really well. Um, I've done other documentaries like outside of crypto. So I, I was a filmmaker before I became a television producer mm. and um, films were not necessarily tech or, um, or nonfiction or uh, Bitcoin or anything like that. So yeah, a lot of, a lot of different things. Uh, Naomi, if, if you had some advice to one of our listeners about how to build freedom, in your life, what, would you, what, what could you tell them about the experience that you've learned about building your own freedom in that journey? Gosh, freedom's real hard to build. It's real hard. It's like soul-crushingly so. All I could say is that, like, be supportive of the people out there who are trying to make a difference. I mean, one of the things that I was a little bit dismayed about mm. um, coming into the libertarian movement was seeing all of these organizations that all seem to have the same goal, but you'd have this very competitive nature between them because they're all fighting for the same pool of donors, right? Mm -hmm. So I disliked seeing that. That made me a little sad. Um, And so advice would be like just realising you're all on the same team. How can you be helping out some of the people? How can you be working together? Because you can probably achieve a lot more if you're not fighting other people or undercutting them. You can probably um, do more to like build a movement that's really substantial. I mean, there are some really great organizations out there. I've had the pleasure of working with a lot of them. Um, Institute for Justice, is they just do tremendous work fighting um, like court cases for people. I did a, a series for John Stossel about the bottleneckers, which is the idea of occupational licensing being this barrier to entry for a lot of poor people and uh, just kind of... Um, uh, it, it basically the idea that you have these, these vested interests um, that are fighting to maintain their stranglehold on certain industries and they make it really hard for competitors to come in. And so you have the Institute for Justice who comes in and, and helps to fight some of these people who basically, it's not just about a private company, they're doing what they want, we need to fight them. Like, no, absolutely not. This is about people who have used lo- lobbyists to uh, have regulatory capture for rent seeking, who are basically using government power to crush their competitors. So IJ comes in and helps fight a lot of that and do it. So they do a bunch of other amazing stuff. Um, that would be, I mean, that's an organization that I, I really love, Future Freedom Foundation I've worked with before. I love what they do. Um, I love the community that's been created. I just got back from Center for Free Enterprise in um, Louis, Louisville, Kentucky. Mm. And they're, um, they're an organization that's at the University of Louisville and they just set up this amazing community that has these reading groups for the students there, exposing them to these ideas that they would have never otherwise heard. Like, it's, I, I love the stuff that they I was really, really happy to see what they were doing there and to meet some of the kids there and be chatting with them. And then Russ Ulbricht, like, if you want to if you want to have a big impact, you know, go to freerust.org, support their campaign. They're still mm-hmm. fighting. This is a political prisoner. This is someone who did not get a fair trial. I was there. I, I heard what the judge is saying, like, mm-hmm. with my own ears 
years, it was disgusting what went on there. So educate yourself about that, support if you can, but spread the word and definitely sign the petition. Naomi Brockwell, you are through and through a Liberty entrepreneur. I am so happy to have you on the show. You can find her daily at youtube.com forward slash Naomi Brockwell TV for all things tech and blockchain related. We'll, in, we'll include all of her social media and contact links in the show notes. Is there any way specifically that people should follow you and keep in touch with you? All of my platforms. I don't trust that one day my Twitter's not just going to be shut down and my YouTube's not going to be shut down. So I would love for you to follow me there. But also I'm on Steemit and Minds.com and Library.io and Memo.cash and BitChute and, and a whole bunch of different things. Bitbacker.io. So, I was going to uh, say, if you, if you want more Naomi Brockwell, go to Bitbacker.io forward slash user forward slash Naomi Brockwell and check out her videos and subscribe there. Throw her some coin, people. We're, yeah. we're helping each other. Uh, Naomi, it's been wonderful. We have another show immediately after this on EOS. So thank you so much for coming on Liberty Entrepreneurs. And until next time, everyone, build freedom. Thanks so much for having me. See ya.